Good morning, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Hi. Oh, good evening. Yeah, that's. <laughs> that's <laughs> I'm probably the only one in the U.S. How's everyone doing today? We're doing well, pretty well. Good. Thank you. So I think we're running into a small issue. I need someone to help me enable sharing because I don't have controls on my end. So if someone from the team can enable sharing, that would be awesome. Perfect. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, let's kick this off. I wanna be respectful of your time. Um, and before we start, I'd like you to scan the QR code and or add this um, in your browser so that you can follow along. I like to make these sessions interactive. Um, so I'm not just speaking to people and we're interacting and engaging. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to add this in your browser and then we'll kick it off. Yeah, I'm technically challenged. How the hell do I add this to my browser? <laughs> okay, so if you have a cell phone, just take your cell phone and um, okay. scan the QR code with your um, camera. Sure. And if you don't have your cell phone available, copy slido.com into a browser and then type in the hashtag and you will get um, activated. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no worries. All right, you'll have opportunities as well throughout when I activate the um, interaction to slot um to scan your browser. So if you haven't done it, um, what I'll do is I'll just kick this off. My name's Mia Floyd. I've been with um, Abu Diga now for about, I would say maybe five months. I am in the level two um, PCC course. And um, it's been a joy for me to participate in the community. The learning, the growing, the relationships has been fantastic. Um, I've spent some time with my the team that our cohort and Jaya, and as a result, Jaya had asked me to facilitate a session specific to um, mindsets. Um, I'll, I'll share with you just a little bit about me. Um, I am an executive coach. I've done coaching now for about 15 years. I do a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. That's where my passion lies. My background is in change management and process improvement. I happened upon change management because it was just what I did um, as a result of you know, my engagements and my professional career. I'm certified in multiple different assessments, but let me just say this to you. My journey around coaching um, started because of the type of leader that I had when I first entered the workforce. And um, I've always looked for that and craved that type of leader um, as I progressed in my career and as such, I wanted to build a community, a culture, the people that I interact with, I wanted them to have and embrace those same types of values. And as such, that's kind of led me to the work and the journey that I'm on. I'll stop sharing my camera for a bit um, so we can kick this off. What we'll do today is talk about the Agile mindset and we'll talk about <clears throat> how embracing that Agile mindset helps to make people awesome delivers value, um, ensures psychological safety, and it encourages a, a place for folks to make mistakes, learn, grow, and be the best version of themselves. All right, so why are we here? Um, as I mentioned to you just a little bit earlier, um, when I first started my career, I had the most amazing leader. My leader was phenomenal. Um, he challenged me, he encouraged me to make mistakes, he encouraged me to take risks, and I naively thought through the rest of my career that that was a type of leader that I would constantly engage with. Needless to say, reality hit me quickly. <laughs> and I recognize that his leadership style was very unique. Unique in that he embraced coaching. He wanted the leaders on his team to succeed. Even the employees who were not in managerial roles, his desire was to cultivate this environment where there was trust, communication, um, an innovation. And as I progressed through my career, I recognized that that just wasn't the standard. To me, that was the gold standard and what I aspired to be. 
but I, I realized very quickly that the, the workforce is competitive. Not every leader has that growth mindset and aren't willing to challenge and embrace risks. We live in this society of perfection where perfection doesn't exist. Um, and hence the reason I do the type of work that I do. So I wanted to share that little um, caveat with you before we kick this off and share with you why embracing agility is so important. So I know when folks hear the word agile, they think about the framework. When um, during this discussion, what you'll realize is we're talking more so about big A agile. And I like to differentiate between the two because agile is a mindset, right? When I talk about agile today, I'll be talking about it through the lens of how do we think how do we respond to change? How do we encourage growth? And how do we um, you know, cultivate an environment of psychological safety versus the framework that's the little a agile and it's the execution, right? So in my experience, you have to have the mindset in order to do the tactical, right? So you can have that mindset and create and cultivate an environment where it's safe to fail, folks take risks, they're communicating, they're engaging, but in order to do that, you have to develop this growth mindset. All right, so ultimately, Agile is a mindset, right? It's a set of principles and a way of working. Agile helps us respond to change and it helps us to stay focused on our goals. Change, obviously, um, is the only thing that's certain. And when we face uncertainty, what we try to do is take risks, get feedback, and adjust accordingly. Unfortunately, the world that we live in, society, our professional environments, it doesn't allow for a lot of risk-taking because of the type of, you know, forward thinking and the, the political, I would just say toxicity that exists sometimes prevents us from taking risks and trying something different. So what I'd like you to do is Scan the QR code or you could um, enter this in your browser and I'd like to hear from you what describes a fixed mindset. What are your thoughts on this? All right, see, I know the polls are working because I see one participant typing. The one that cannot change or grow, yep. Rigid, absolutely. <laughs> Not open to change, rigid, inflexible, comfort, status quo. Yep. And we've all encountered, um, you know, folks that we've interact with either on our personal or professional level that's had a fixed mindset. All right. Looks like there's a couple more people typing, so I'll give them some time. And just a heads up at any time, if anyone wants to come off mute and share their ideas, please don't um, feel shy. Um, I welcome your thoughts and your feedback. I am the best. Yep. <laughs> it's my way or the highway, right? No certain and conventional ways of doing things. Inability to learn something new. Absolutely. These are all attributes of a fixed mindset. Now we'll pivot a bit and just think about the growth mindset. And actually, this is incorrect. It should say, what is a growth mindset? So if you would ignore the statement and just think about what is a growth mindset. Ever learning. Open and willing to learn, explore, widening experience, learn. willing to change, open to ideas, experimental style. We can learn from every experience, yep. High risk taking, I like that. I don't know, but I'm willing to learn. Innovative, creative. And these are all really good. Humble, peak of 
at peak of success, thinking there's more. Yep. Open and accepting, valuing others' opinions, trying, yep, making any attempt, right? Recognizing that sometimes you fail, sometimes you make mistakes, but there's always an opportunity to learn and grow. So when you look at these images, um, you know, I pulled some content from a Gallup study and research has basically shared that when workers perceive their company to have the mindset, tools, and processes of an agile culture, that organization is more likely um, to have satisfied customers, their companies are ahead of the competition, their financial future is secure, and their employee, the employer is successful. Their employees are happy, they're growing, they're thriving, they're having conversations. So the theory of the growth mindset isn't new. It came out of some research done by Carol Dweck and her colleagues. A growth mindset isn't something that people are always born with. Kids and adults can develop the belief that things are hard to do now, but may not always be hard. I'll give you a personal story here. Um, both my girls are competitive tennis players, and it was a muscle that they had to develop as they grew in their tennis careers. I often relate many of the examples in their lives back to tennis because I have to remind them, in order for you to be an elite athlete, you had to practice, you had to develop, you had to grow this muscle, and you also had to shift the way you think. So for every opportunity and or engagement that you have, you have to cultivate a very similar mindset. You may not be good at it today, but the more you try, the bigger the muscle becomes and the stronger you, your belief and your execution. So I say that to say, you know, any individual who believes their talents can be developed through hard work, good strategies and input from others, those are the folks that have growth mindsets. They tend to achieve more than others just because their mindset's willing to adapt and be nimble. Um, and they worry less about looking smart and put more energy into learning. They recognize that mistakes are part of growth. You know, people confuse a growth mindset with being flexible, open-minded, or having a positive outlook. Everyone is actually a mixture of both growth um, fixed and growth mindsets. What happens is that that growth mindset evolves with experience. What's important to understand is that our mindsets are not set in stone. A growth mindset helps people to reframe their approach to challenges, stay motivated, and improve skills. So instead of thinking, I can't do this, they say, I can't do it yet. So those qualities inspire hope and it shores up engagement, which are vital elements for workplace engagement, culture, and it helps influence um, productivity. Even when a workforce is facing difficult business environment and or obstacles, when folks have that growth mindset, they recognize that they can be challenged. These challenges and these obstacles help them to grow and they accept feedback. So we talked a lot about mindsets and the difference between the mindset and the framework. What's important is that everyone can benefit from adopting a mindset and principles that make Agile work. Um, here's an excerpt from Modern Agile, and we'll use this as kind of the foundation for the conversation um, that we'll have. What is important to realize here is, you know, these principles are completely aligned and support the values and behaviors that allow employees to be their authentic selves, that allow leaders to show up differently. You know, when you think about this model for mod Modern Agile, it's about making people awesome. What is your role as a coach? What is your role as a parent? What is your role as a friend, right? At the end of the day, you know, the humanness in us wants to make people awesome. We think about delivering value continuously, right? How do we continuously improve? How do we take risks, experiment, learn rapidly? And then how do we create an environment where safety is a prerequisite, right? You're creating this culture and cultivating teams, relationships where people feel safe to fail. Um, these are shown as separate quadrants, but they're all interrelated and op, um, they interact, I'm sorry, they interlap. So we think about making people awesome, right? Steve Jobs used to ask his team, what incredible benefits can we give to the customer? Where can we take the customer? In Agile, we ask, how do we make people awesome, right? This includes people who use, make, buy, or sell Fund our, fund our products or services. We learn their context, their pain points, and whatever holds them back and what they aspire to achieve. We think about this from a, a leadership perspective. It's what can we do to help develop these employees? 
So we're talking about people in, in you know, a very broad statement, but let's think about the people that we interact with. Let's think about the people that we deliver value to. So in this, this example, we'll talk about the customer. You know, when I, when I engage with businesses and I work with leaders, I like to reinforce that your customers are your employee, right? So whether it's the employee, the colleague, the stakeholder, what you want to understand from them is what makes them grow? What challenges them? You want to get to learn these individuals on the most human and basic level so that you have the opportunity to understand what motivates them. You know, we can ask ourselves specifically, you know, what kind of experience are we trying to create? Create Empathizing with our employees and our customers, giving them what they need, we can ensure that we're trying to make them awesome and help them become the best version of themselves. When we collaborate cross-functionally, what we're trying to do is break these silos down that's persisted since the last century. We want to streamline the work that we do. So applying the make people awesome principle also extends to how we connect with our teams and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. I don't know about you, but that line of sight completely motivates me and it's kind of the foundation for the work that I do. Any thoughts, questions, feedback before we proceed? I've been talking a lot really fast over the last 20 minutes. Business success and or failure more than workplace culture. According to Gallup, well-being and engagement interact with each other in powerful ways. When employees are engaged in thriving, they experience significantly less anger and health problems. Unfortunately, a lot of employees are disengaged at work. Um, low engagement costs the global economy $7.8 trillion. The relationship between well-being and engagement is obviously vital, right? Because how people experience work influences their lives out of work. Their overall well-being influences their life at work. I worked with this organization one time. I was helping some senior leaders in the, um, in the IT group think about how to transform and create a different culture um, because they had high turnover. There was a lot of passive aggressive behavior. The communication was just toxic and poor. And what these leaders under, had to understand was they had to shift the way they showed up and the way they interacted in order to change that culture across the environment. Agile leadership is related to employee success and retention in a plethora of different ways, right? What they realize is in order for their employees to be successful, have conversations, recognize that this was a safe place, they had to create that sense of ownership and autonomy or amongst their employees. It wasn't as do as I say, it was how can we make this organization better? What are some of your ideas and or thoughts, right? So when we think about agile leadership, it's promoting that culture of continuous learning and improvement, creating a positive and supportive work environment, which ultimately leads to employee retention and a sense of belonging and purpose. So we think about the growth mindset. Adopting this mindset can lead to greater success and satisfaction, both in, personal, in our per personal and professional lives. It also allows individuals to see challenges as opportunities for growth and approach situations with a positive and optimistic outlook versus I'm afraid to fail, I'm afraid to take a risk. So when we think about having a fixed mindset, it limits those potentials and possibilities. It holds individuals back from reaching their full potential. I have a question, yeah? Yes. Yeah, uh, what makes a leader toxic? That's, that's one of the biggest challenges that I've faced when I've dealt with leaders as well. So what, according to you, makes a leader toxic? Yeah, I, I don't know, um, Siddharth, that there's one singular response to that question, right? There's a plethora mm. of reasons, and I'm sure there's multiple articles and research that talks about toxicity. Mm. You know, in my experience, I can, I can only speak from that lens. Sure. It's just that desire to reach the top, recognizing that, or not recognizing that in order to be successful, you need the team. Um, being so 
focused on climbing the ladder or getting something done that you don't take a step back. I'll talk a little bit about how our education system kind of plays into that mindset. Sure. But I just don't know that there's any single factor that creates, you know, the toxic leader or a toxic organization. It's just a, a plethora of beliefs, behaviors, attitudes, and maybe they've been rewarded for that type of behavior. A lot mm -hmm. of the leaders that I work with, um, it's been my experience that that behavior has been incentivized either by promotion and or uh, monetarily. Mm -hmm. And as a result, that's the only way they know how to lead. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Any anyone has anything to add about that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I think to Siddharth's question, I won't put those two words together, toxic and leader. I'd rather put a toxic manager. Wow. <laughs> a leader, <laughs> anyway, it's uh, he defies the whole thing if he is toxic. He yeah. won't lead it. Yeah, that's yeah, a really good point. <laughs> yeah, leadership, leadership is seen as a very big spiritual aspect, right? So when you look at leaders versus managers, uh, but yeah, you, you're absolutely right on that aspect. Yeah. Leaders and are I think, uh, yeah, well, yeah, one key thing I have seen in my corporate career over the years mm. as Mia said it's a it's a conglomeration of so many things right. uh, one is of course the organization culture it means toxicity breeds toxicity and it's a spiral and you can't come out of it but right. one key factor I've seen are managers who predominantly mm. believe in the word I rather than they I don't even go we mm. this I I a philosophy is I think one one of the many uh, seeds of toxicity Okay. Yeah, right. that's a really good point. And there's there's a big difference, right, between being a manager and a leader. Mm -hmm. Leaders are exactly. usually seen as coaches, right? They want their employees to develop. They want to create a workplace where that's inclusive. Whereas mm -hmm. a manager is still at that very tactical level. They do, they do. <laughs> and they're mm -hmm. not creating that leadership to drive the future leaders across the organization. So absolutely, yeah. yeah. So Mia, can I share my view here? Please, yeah. Yeah, I think when we look at toxicity, we are looking at from the employee perspective, right? Saying, hey, this mm. is a toxic manager or a toxic leader. But what goes inside uh, that person to create or uh, manifest that toxicity in them is generally the lack of support because in those leadership roles and manager role, people feel alone. There is a lot of frustration building up. There is no space yeah. to... Um, let down there is no space uh, there is no space for failure and mistakes and that's what creates the pressure so where will the pressure go pressure will go over to the team members right so the another perspective about it is you know people don't take time to work on themselves to be able to um, relax from the emotional level and mm -hmm. think on their behaviors they're just going on and on simply because there's a pressure from up there is a pressure from down and the only way they can uh, can get the work done or create success is by commanding, and that's where they go. So I think that's a that's a fantastic point, uh, honestly, because I've I've seen that a lot of toxic managers hmm. are not able to introspect. I think that's that's yeah. the last thing that that's on their agenda. You know, it's introspection is is way out for them. Yeah, so, the, yeah, the thing is, nobody comes to workplace to be toxic. Nobody wants to, yeah. be toxic, right? Nobody wants right. to come across as toxic. These are people mm -hmm. like us who have families and children and uh, want to live a positive life. But then I think the pressures from all the places and no space to uh, let down creates that toxicity. That's yeah. what I want to share. Thank you, Jaya. That, that's a really good point, right? Because when you think about leaders or managers, executives and organizations, they don't have a safe space to be authentic. They don't have a safe space to vent. They don't have that environment where they can, you know, share their experience when it's negative with a peer. Um, and as a result, they build this guard. That guard leads to how they, they manage, how they interact. Um, so Jaya, thank you for sharing that. All right, so in what ways is agile leadership related to employee success and retention? This is a multiple choice engagement. Feel free to make your selection.
All right. So in what ways is agile leadership related to employee success and retention? If if you're not engaging on the polls, feel free to come off mute and share your perspective. So we have fostering a sense of ownership, promoting continuous learning, creating a positive work environment. We have five folks that answered, and that's absolutely right. We talked a little bit about the mindset. How do we recreate that ownership, the difference between leaders and managers and how those folks interact? You know, so the principles that we talked about specifically lead to employee success, happiness, retention, communication, engagement. Um, you know, I facilitated this um, multiple different times and, and you'd be surprised, right? The conversations that ensue about leadership, the agile mindset and, and what it does to employee, um, you know, emotional, mental and physical responses and our reactions. All right, so deliver value continuously. In Agile, we ask ourselves, you know, how could valuable work be delivered faster? You know, I think the world is familiar with Amazon. Um, when we think about Amazon, it's just delivering value continuously and iter iteratively. This requires us to divide larger amounts of information into smaller pieces so that we can deliver value safely, rapidly, and we're constantly responding to the customer. It helps us to think about how we plan, how we deliver our work, how we engage, and then always trying to improve, looking for the baseline and using that as a, a starting point so that we can continuously improve. We think about how we deliver value to our employees, um, to an organization that we participate with. What we, want to, what, what we want to think about is even if you have to deliver value in small increments, Learning from those experiences helps us to drive and transform the culture because we're constantly having conversations, right? So if we break these down um, into what's working well, where's the opportunity to improve? How are we having these conversations so that we're shifting the dynamics and folks understand that the culture that we're trying to drive is drastically different than that command and control, right? How are we welcoming folks into these conversations? So we think about fostering empowerment, right? By delivering value continuously, leaders are creating this culture of trust, transparency, teams are empowered to make decisions. They're not, they're held accountable for their results, which helps the organization stay competitive and it responds to customers' needs, which helps to drive business and success. It's not to say that organizations that are not agile and or don't embrace this culture of transparency and psychological safety aren't successful, but at what cost, right? How is it impacting the environment that they work with and their employees? When I think about great leadership, you know, great leaders engage their workforce, they hold people accountable, they manage performance, they, they're constantly coaching and developing their employees and they work well with other managers. There's a significant amount of transparency and they embody that you know, mentality where it's a we philosophy, it's not an I. And we talked about that just a little bit earlier. It's not I say, it's what do we do? How do I learn from you? They're encouraging their employees to identify better and more efficient ways to get work done which helps to eliminate waste, increase employee satisfaction because they feel like they're part of the process. Any thoughts? All right, so what are some ways that you feel valued at work? Any thoughts here? being appreciated. Acknowledge for the work. I'm asked instead of always ordered, recognize, appreciated, included, chosen for challenging work, respect, timely recognition. Accepted. 
So the example that I gave when we kicked this off um, with the leader that I had that was just fantastic, one of the ways that he made me feel valued at work is a lot of the comments that are we're receiving in the chat. It's he included me in decision making. He asked my perspective. There was lots of brainstorming um, sessions with our entire leadership team. It wasn't as the leader, you do as I say, it's how can we do this together? How can we learn? What are some of the ideas that you have? So highlighting those team achievements, yep, progression. All right, thanks for the engagement. Learning by doing. So humans learn by doing. It's just the way our brains are hardwired. Have you ever heard the saying, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime? Every time I think about learning by doing, this is the quote that I, um, I reflect on. You know, agile leadership involves continuous learning and adaptation. You know, as the agile approach values continuous improvement and evolution, if you tell someone what to do, the likelihood of them being successful and or remembering it is less than if you teach them how to do. You embrace their opportunities for growth. Right. So agile leaders are always looking for ways to improve their leadership style and, and support their teams and deliver in any type of value, whether it's to their internal customer or their external customer. What I like to say is you can't make people awesome or deliver value continuously if you aren't learning. So when we think about the organizations that you work with, um, how is failure seen in your organization? Is failure seen as an opportunity for growth? Oh, I see, not really. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, failure is in an opportunity for growth in my So, how do I read that comment? Sorry, you're breaking up just a bit. I, I'm saying that your uh, the rating should be against the statement that you have shared. Failure is seen as an opportunity for growth in my organization. No, yes. But if I agree to that or disagree, that's extreme. So if you agree to that, you would go to the far right with the okay. um, heart emoji. If you disagree with that, extremely disagree, you would go all the way to the left. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. This is positive, right? We see some, you know, to the far right, which is, is it's great. Like you want to work in, and engage with folks that recognize that we all make mistakes, we all fail, and there's opportunities to learn from, from those experiences. So what we'll do right now is, is talk about failure just a bit, right? Um, the big F word is what I like to call it because folks are not comfortable with this word, particularly in corporate environment. There's a considerable amount of shame that employees and even managers, leaders feel are about failing. I met with a leadership team a few months back and someone shared a, a really interesting perspective and I hadn't considered it before. And what she said is perhaps it's the way our education system is designed. We're expected to make all A's and when we don't, we're seen as, we're seen as less than. I also think too, when I reflect back on my childhood, there's also cultural expectations, right? That we have from the way we were raised um, that helps us to see failure, not necessarily as an opportunity to, to grow and improve, but that idea of perfection, that was something that was rooted in how my parents raised me, right? It wasn't until I became an adult and I recognized, well, I learned most <laughs> from when I make mistakes. So I had to shift that mindset as I started to raise my family so that I didn't make my kids think that perfection was the only way to attain success. So the idea behind a return on failure is that in the long run, the value gained from learning from failure can outweigh the cost of failure itself. We think about how this translates to the workplace. To maximize the return on failure, we have to have a supportive and open culture that encourages experimentation risk and risk-taking. It requires a willingness to accept failures as a natural part of the learning process and a commitment 
to learning from those mistakes in a constructive and non-judgmental way. We have to reframe how we view failure. When we look at this model, you know, it's something that's necessary and valuable to create innovation and in achieving anything worthwhile. Minimize your investment, right? So consider how you might feel fast and cheaply by reducing your investment. Use prototypes, minimal viable products to gain feedback, inviting the customers into co-creation, inviting employees. And that way, you know, you fail with lower cost. We think about maximizing the learning. Take time to talk about failure and analyze it. Have discussions, whiteboarding sessions, you know, build root cause analysis and reflection into the process, have retrospectives so that you're constantly talking and improving on what you did the last time. Mental models, right? We think about mental, mental models. Instead of taking a superficial, discrete lesson about failure, what we wanna do is take time to think about the consequences. What are the consequences and or implications? You know, if you're having a terrible clash with your kid, right? Rather than taking a parenting, rather than just saying it's a parenting lesson, Consider how you, know, you increase your insights. Consider how that lesson might, might apply to other contexts that you're working with them with um, to help their growth and development. You're just using these processes to update and improve your mental models. And then finally, just sharing your learning. You know, sometimes you work in teams um, and it's a silo team. What you wanna do is think about how you bring those learnings and engage that workforce. You know, how do you uncover and share your learnings? Talking candidly about these failures, I made a mistake, yep. Um, how do we improve on this the next time? How do we change that font, right? Um, how do we, you know, transform this presentation so that it's more meaningful to the stakeholders that we're delivering it to? You know, so we think about talking candidly about our failures, what will happen as a result is we're providing values for others and we're cultivating this culture where folks recognize that that big F word is not a bad thing. It drives credibility and people see and value you differently because you're willing to um, show up and say, "I my bad, I made a mistake. And you're authentic about that. So communication and collaboration, we talked about this throughout the session, right? They're vital to learning. I'm pretty sure this is, you know, you've heard this before, continuous improvement and failing fast allows um, employees, people, personal experiences, children to feel like they can share their perspective, point of view, and every opportunity to foster teamwork should be embraced. However, not everyone is, you know, accustomed or used to being in an environment where team playing is, you know, embraced. But what we're trying to encourage is opening up a concept of teamwork it can make folks feel more confident about their expertise. As Jaya mentioned, right? No one shows up to work and they wanna be toxic. What they wanna do is share their expertise. You hire people and organizations for very specific skill sets. So bring them into the conversation, connecting with them on a personal level, understanding how you, know, you can utilize the strengths on your team so that your organization and that business unit and or that specific group is performing at their highest potential. We think about the agile mindset, it's eliminating that I and focusing on the we. I think Pratik said that earlier. This cannot be achieved without unity amongst the team. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with groups, um, managers, individual contributors, and there's this constant tension about, you know, finger pointing and blaming. There's no collaboration and it just stifles their growth. Um, the culture is not positive. There's no psychological safety. You know, so what I try to encourage is having that um, engagement where folks are cooperating, they're working together, they're being transparent, they're having direct conversations about disagreements in the room and not walking out in the hallway and or at the cooler and expressing their frustrations there. I also um, talk about the quiet folks in the room. Sometimes you have people that are not willing to con contribute and or are fearful because of their personality and or their experience, right? So bringing them into the conversation to offer ideas, share their learning, share their experience is also a way to create that collaboration. And then what we want to do is ensure that the loudest person in the room is also willing to listen to other ideas. 
I'm sure we've all experienced that individual that has all the answers, knows all the information, and it kind of, you know, stifles that collaboration that can ensue. Um, but when we invite those shyer or um, quieter folks into the conversation, it changes the dynamic. Transparency is also key, right? Sharing these responsibilities and being accountable and ensuring that we're having um, honest conversations about where we are, how interactions, engagements, and conversations have impacted us. Um, you know, withholding information is also something that I've noticed within organizations that doesn't foster this collaboration. All right, so making safety a prerequisite. Um, a few years ago, I was brought into a company to help with challenges associated with a reorg. After meeting with various leaders, there was a significant disconnect um, because leadership didn't commit to the process that they had put in place. And all of the old ways of working was showing up in the new world. Um, leaders brought me in to fix the problem and create another process. Um, I'm pretty sure you can guess how that went, right? There was no trust. Um, across the leadership team, as well as the direct reports and then the stakeholders that they engage with. So one of my first goals was to commit to following through on the process that they had designed initially for the overall transformation, not change the process. And that was a tough conversation to have because from their perspective, it was, well, this process is broken, so you need to fix it. And I had to take a step back and say, have you tried the process? How has the process been working? What are the statistics? Where's the data? Where's the metrics around what you've implemented and the money that you've invested? Agile mindsets, agile execution, agile framework does not work without psychological safety. And what I had to enforce with these leaders is creating this environment of psychological safety only exists when trust is built in a group. And that environment allows, it creates a dynamic where individuals are willing and ready to perform. You can't invest in a process and say it's broken if you're not changing your behaviors to match the process. People need to be safe to express their ideas. And these employees didn't feel like they could disagree with their leaders. You know, they didn't feel like they could take risks. So they paid for um, an agile transformation and they were blaming the employees, but their behavior as leaders was still in that mindset of what we did before. So their actions didn't match the new framework and the new culture that they were trying to drive. You know, so employees weren't feeling safe to take risks um, without feeling insecure or embarrassed. And they just reverted back to old ways of working. Um, as a result of, you know, the time that I spent with them, it was a tough conversation about what they had, what they were looking to accomplish, and how they would get there. And, and they realized that in order to make a commitment on this investment, they truly had to change the way they engaged, the way they communicated, the way they interacted, and recognize that people aren't afraid of failure. They are afraid of blame. So they needed to invite the employees into the conversation. One of the leaders said to me, I'm so sick of hearing about this word psychological safety. It just makes me feel like I want to throw up. <laughs> and one of his peers just challenged him. And he said, do you realize that that statement is why we're in the situation that we are today? Even though psychological safety is a shared responsibility of everyone in the team, it is a leader's obligation to ensure that psychological safety is present. Um, you know, leaders must recognize that they have a significant role to play with that title as leader. They can aid in the induction of high psychological safety by reinforcing it, having uncomfortable conversations, calling people out like, like his peer did um, during that roundtable session, and then participating in conflict resolution, whatever that might look like. And sometimes it means being bold, eliminating team members who pose a threat, who are not showing up the way we expect them to, and then creating this environment of two-way trust. So it's everyone's responsibility every single day. So agile leaders play a crucial role in promoting psychological safety. You know, this environment of trust, openness, and inclusiveness it's a responsibility of leaders, but everyone across the organization. 
Um, you can achieve this through active listening, transparent communication, avoiding blame and retaliation when things go wrong. Um, leaders support their teams by encouraging risk-taking and recognizing and celebrating success, no matter how small these successes are. Any thoughts, questions, feedback? All right. Uh, just uh, one so, thought in terms of uh, may please. I took it, share? Yes, please. In terms of the changing scenario post pandemic, uh, can you go back one slide? Some of the stuff listed there in terms of uh, safety, a prerequisite, uh, it has gone much beyond. Uh, the professional domain into personal lives of people and the flexibility they are looking at, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, my belief is that uh, the safety part of it, there is uh, things that have crept in in terms of uh, how empathetic the leaders are towards their employees, the flexibility and the resilience of the individuals and uh, the kind of anxiety that builds up in terms of uh, the dynamics of the environment that is happening right now. So just a thought that these are only adding up to the challenges and new skills that needs to be uh, developed with leaders for the new normal that is there. I agree, Sanjay. There's a lot of research being done um, within the last, you know, two to three years specific to the pandemic and how folks engage um, expectations to be camera ready 100% of the time. There's this thing called camera fatigue, right? We are on camera almost all day long with our personal and sometimes our, prof well, our professional, but sometimes our personal interactions that we grow exhausted. And to your point, leaders are going to have to evolve the way they think, their expectations, the way they interact, because the world that we saw, I would say maybe five years ago, um, is just not the same today, right? Um, we have to listen differently. We have to encourage um, how folks in contribute, can contribute. And we need to let people know that we're listening. <laughs> All right, we're gonna bring us home. Um, in one word, what does it mean to have a psychologically safe workplace? Be heard without repercussions, respect. Assurance. Trust, respect. Peace of mind. I like that. <laughs> Feeling like you can show up to work and have a bad day, right? <laughs> and recognizing that everyone has a bad day. And that's not going to impact how folks interact and or engage with you. Open up and show the vulnerable side too. Yep, absolutely. Recognize that that vulnerability creates trust across the team. 
Awesome. Well, I want to thank you all um, for your time today, the engagement, um, the conversations. It's been a pleasure. I like to leave this session specifically saying, um, be the change you wish to see in the world, right? A quote by Mahatma Gandhi, commit to trying some of these ideas that you've um, heard during today's session and during the discussion. It was good input and insight from, you know, folks who participated. Don't forget about the human component. We're all facing a personal challenge that might impact the way we work, the way we show up. If you see something, say something. Lift your colleagues up, help them understand the benefits of failing fast, experimenting, creating that culture of vulnerability where they feel safe to be their authentic selves. Thank you all for your time. You have a great evening and it was nice talking to you. Thank you, Mia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So much. Just a quick question. Yes, please. Would you be sharing this deck? Because I, I joined a bit late, so if at all. I I'm happy to share the deck. It's just pretty, it, there's not a lot of content, but I'm still happy to send it over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, no problem. Thank you. All right, have a nice day, everyone. You should go